It is said that nothing defines a region more than a body of water. This is particularly true in the American West. The Colorado River and the tributaries that make up her basin shape the spirit of her settlers. El Rio, Colorado, the river colored red from the land she flows through, made this dry land not only livable, but irresistible to settlement. Even still, her famed early explorer, John Wesley Powell, warned that combining arid land and civilization would eventually lead to a crisis. As the Wild West was tamed, so were the waters of the Colorado River Basin. The relentless march towards progress led to the 1922 Colorado River Compact and other agreements among seven American and two Mexican states to divvy up the water. They transformed one of the world's wildest rivers, capable of creating grand canyons and inland seas, into the most dammed, dibbed, and diverted river basin in the world. A machine supporting the needs of 30 million people. Agriculture, industry, urban growth, mining, energy production claw for their share. So much so that the mighty Colorado River of today rarely, if ever, reaches her delta in the Gulf of California. With populations in the region expected to reach 50 million by 2050, temperatures rising and precipitation patterns becoming more erratic, demand will outpace supply unless we embrace a new water ethic. One that questions not only how we use water, but how it affects the world around us. Across the Colorado River Basin, from a fly fishing guide in Rocky Mountain National Park, to a wetland restoration worker in the river's delta, a rancher in Colorado, to a bike messenger in Los Angeles, a mayor in mining country, to a Navajo County Commissioner, there are those not only asking the questions, but acting on them daily. We'll do camp outs uh, on the river and fly fish. Uh, my wife, when I first met her, I thought she was kind of just doing it to make me happy, but she really enjoys it also, and it's uh, something that the kids have learned, and it's just a really great way to bond as a family, getting out on the river and catching a few fish and uh, seeing nature together and just being away from the video games and the TVs. I've never really considered myself a conservationist. I enjoy these places and I want to be, be able to come to them. I also make my living off of these places. Living here now in Colorado, where the population base is a lot larger, and uh, it seems like less water overall. The demand, you can see everyone tugging for their share of what, what flows out of these mountains. It's raining here in LA right now. Go to the LA River and look at how it rages. Something like three million people could survive off the, off the water of the LA River if it was cultivated properly. That's where we should be putting, uh, putting our attention, into our own natural landscape right here in our city. That's where we should have been here from the, from the very beginning, but it's not. Instead, it's like 250 miles away where we get our water from. Talk about unsustainable. I mean, even the water commutes to LA, come on. <laughs> Originally, there were boats, speed boats, coming up to Juma from the Gulf. There were a lot of cottonwoods and willows, wildlife like dolphins, turtles, jaguar. And there were so many birds that they were like clouds in the sky. The magnificence of the delta when it had all this water. I cannot imagine how that would have looked. It's... The end of the river is mainly mud flats. It gives you a real sense of what the delta is without water flowing right now. There is a relationship between the environment and your life. It's interesting to see the river 
upstream the river in the U.S. and then go to the delta and see it without water flowing. The area is not in good condition. It's not a balance in, let's say, our society. There's something missing. The logic of the 21st century is economically driven. Let's extract as much as we can out of a resource for consumption and development. A place like Echo Park, thinking that 60 years ago there was a very serious conversation about damming that thing and putting it 500 feet underwater. David Brower, president of Sierra Club, and who was it at the time? Floyd Dominey, I guess, came out. And for as economically driven as Floyd Dominey was, I mean, head of Bureau of Reclamation, his job was to make money off of river systems. After one river trip down here, they said, no way can we put a dam here. This is worth preserving. And soon enough, it became a monument. I was really shocked that the Colorado River does not reach its delta. And I, I knew that there were dams, but I thought that people made minor changes without interfering with the the river as a whole, and I had no idea that it was all gone before it reached where it should go. In order to get some water here in, in the Delta, the idea is to work binationally. The, the binational cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico has become really important. It has increased both the interest and the knowledge about the Delta. And then people, they realize the conditions in which the Delta is. And then they start talking about how they can help. We're only asking for a base flow. A little water will make a big difference in the, the environment, the wildlife and the communities as well. When I think about the, the Delta, if the idea is that 2% increase uh, of, of water there would, would restore that place, that's not a lot to ask at all. You know, I'm not sure to what degree uh, we're causing this climate change or anything. It's obviously happening. It's our responsibility to leave this stuff to future generations. I don't think the legacy we want to leave is a planet that is so far gone that uh, can't be uh, recaptured at that time. This land ultimately belongs to, to the earth. I think we're just, we're caretakers. 